Okay, so this is the model of our animal plasma membranes. And does anybody remember what this model was called? Has a name. Anybody have it in their notes? Something, something model. This is referred to as the fluid mosaic model. So remember that the fluid part refers to the fact that these plasma membranes, our animal cells are very fluid. <clears throat> Which is actually very different from plant cells because plant cells have cell walls. We do not see a cell wall around our cells. So our, our, our um, structures are different, our plasma membranes are different, and the mosaic part has to do with these different things that are embedded in the plasma membrane. So we were talking about how the plasma membrane is semi-permeable, meaning that some substances can cross it and sub -su some substances can't. So if, sub, if a substance can cross the plasma membrane, um, it can move from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, and this is what is referred to as diffusion. So don't think of these as sugar molecules, think of these as something else, maybe lipids, that go from a high concentration outside the cell, they're going to diffuse across the surface, and then eventually they will reach an equilibrium. And so does this process take energy? No. No. Right? So it's a passive process. We're going to talk about today later on how if I wanted to take these and move them against their concentration gradient, if I wanted to get these to go outside, I would have to use energy. But diffusion just moves with the concentration gradient. Now when we talk about solutions, remember that they have two components. They have the solutes and the solvent. So any solution like sugar solution, uh, salt solution has the solute plus the solvent. So we have lots of different solutes in our blood plasma. Our blood plasma is the water component that contains all kinds of proteins and other things in solution. So when we talk about um, uh, the relative concentration of a solution, we generally refer to the solute in concentration, right? So when we talk about an isotonic solution, and I'll talk about what this tonic means in a minute. Iso means same. So you can think of like an isosceles triangle has the same, um, uh, the sides are exactly the same dimensions, right? So iso means same. So this would be mean that the, the two solutions would have the same solute concentration. So this is same solute concentration. So what if you wear contacts and you need to put the saline solution into your eyes? That would be an example of an isotonic solution. So saline solutions Okay, that means saline means that it has a little bit of salt in it. And so when we do that, it doesn't cause our eyes to sting or anything because the salt concentrations are the same in the solution as they are in the solution that is bathing our eye cells. If you've ever, you know, um, surely you have opened your eyes underwater, like in a lake, and you know that that can be kind of painful because that lake water would have a lower salt concentration, or salt water in your eyes when you're at the ocean can also be painful because of the difference in solute concentrations. Okay. So when we talk about a hypertonic solution, hyper means high. So that's opposed to hypo. So think hyperthermic, high temperature. 
right? High solute concentration. So this means that the solute concentration is greater than or higher. Oops, solute, sorry. Ah, solute concentration. So ocean water tends to be like maybe 3% salt. Um, our eyes are 0.9%. And so that uh, marine environment would be hypertonic compared to these solutions that bathe our cells. And then we have what is referred to as hypotonic, which is the solute concentration is lower than So for those of you who are at lab on Monday, what was the hypotonic solution we put our cells into? Distilled water, right? So distilled water has had all of the solutes taken out of it. So water has evaporated and then they've collected that evaporated water so there's no solutes in it. So solute will always be hypotonic compared to the inside of our cells. So the thing that you need to realize about these is the first thing is, is that it's not related relating to the concentration of water, but rather the solute. The other thing is, is that these terms make no sense unless you're saying you're comparing one part to another. So the inside of a cell to the outside of the cell, okay? So if we look at, for example, Right? If we put a red blood cell in distilled water, so this is my distilled water, what is the red blood cell going to be compared to the distilled water? Will it be iso, hyper, or hypotonic? Hypertonic. So the inside of the red blood cell is hypertonic compared to the outside. Lots of things in solution there. When we look at the distilled water, however, we would say that the distilled water is hypotonic compared to the inside. So notice how I use those terms relatively. From the inside to the outside, from the outside to the inside. So what happens when you put red blood cells into distilled water? What is going to happen? Does anybody know? Want to take a guess? Water is going to flow in, and it's going to flow in so fast that it's going to cause the cell to rupture. Right? So water will flow in, and the cell will just rupture. And so like if you took a slide of your blood, you put a drop of distilled water on it and you looked at it under the microscope, there would be no cells to observe. Yes. Is that how you can die from drinking too much water? Um, not, I don't know if the red blood cells rupture, but yes, that's a good point. I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. So uh, this is why they don't give you distilled water in your IVs. Right? You go to the hospital, they gave you saline solution. They do not give you distilled water because that would cause your red blood cells to rupture, right? And then you wouldn't be able to carry oxygen in your body. So that's how those um, terms are used. Now, the diffusion of water has a special name, and it is referred to as osmosis. So this is my diffusion of water. And it can actually have a pressure. It can actually exert a pressure. So again, this is a non-living system. So this would be like a, just a membrane, a synthetic membrane, right? If you look at this solution, you would think, well, how come the, um, the uh, solutes are not moving, right? That's one thing I would say. Why are don't, why don't they moving so that it becomes an equilibrium? One reason is, is that this membrane is not permeable to the solutes, right? So the solute 
the solutes cannot move across to form an equilibrium. So what happens is, is that when we look at this, we see that the water molecules are at a higher concentration, right? There's more water over here. So water will actually force its way over and it will push against gravity, right? And so we get osmotic pressure occurring here. Right? So osmosis is the movement of water and water moves from a higher concentration. So from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. So we're not talking about the solutes because on this side it's hypertonic compared to this side. This side is hypotonic compared to that side. And now they're isotonic because they have and they've reached the equilibrium so that they're the same solute concentration. Now, osmosis is import, important in both plants and animals. And the reason why we call it tonic, tonicity, because it actually um, can create rigidness in plants. So when your plants start to wilt, right, they're losing their tonicity, they're losing water, water is evaporating out. And when they um, gain water, then they're gonna become more rigid because the cell is going to push against the, the outer cell wall. So if we look at in plants, right? So if you gave plants or turned them into a hypertonic condition, okay, the water would actually be drawn out. So say for example, if you put a plant cell in, um, in salt water, not distilled water, but salt water, water will be drawn out, right? And then that will cause wilting. So this is dehydration and wilting. And you can put plants in water, or if you if you're, have like loose or limp vegetables in your refrigerator, if you put them in tap water, they tend to become more rigid because they take in the water and notice how they have a central vacuole that contains water that would then press against the cell wall and create a tonicity. So uh, a state of um, pressure being exerted against that outer cell membrane. Okay. So this is the um, similar thing that can happen to animal cells. So if you were to put salt water in your blood, it would actually cause water to leave because um, salt water has a higher solute concentration, so water would move out. Okay. Saline solution, water actually moves back and forth. And then in a hypotonic solution, water floods in and actually causes the cell to rupture. Interestingly, you know, we used to think that this might have been the reason why uh, when we were in the bathtub, you might have heard this. When you're in the bathtub and your, your uh, fingers and toes wrinkle, right? And you're like, what is up with that? Does, this have, does that have anything to do with osmosis? And the answer is actually no. What they've discovered is, is that the wrinkling is actually due to your nervous system. Sensing that your hands and feet are in water, and if your hands and feet become wrinkled, the, I, the hypothesis is, is, is that you'll actually get better, be able to hold on to stuff better, right? So a wrinkled fingers, you might actually be able to grip something underwater better, and wrinkled feet, the same thing, right? So it's kind of interesting that it really doesn't have anything to do with osmosis because our outer skin layer is dead cells that are keratinized, so they're filled with structural protein, so they don't tend to gain or lose water. However, if you've ever had a scab, right, and you it comes off in the bathtub, one of the things that you'll notice is, is that sometimes underneath, the tissue underneath that is healing will swell. And that is due to osmosis because water from the bathtub would go into those cells and cause the swelling of the cells, okay? So that is um, osmosis, but the other wrinkling of the fingers and the feet are not. Okay, so that is movement across the protein or across the membrane without the help of proteins. So we're gonna look at the structure of the um, plasma membrane and we're gonna look at the role that these different proteins play. 
So this would actually be a really good essay question for Monday's quiz to give me some examples of the roles that plasma membranes play in the cell. So the first thing that they can do is, is that they can form channels. Oops, form, there we go, channels. And so that's why you see some of these proteins actually having a hole right through the middle. So remember that um, charged particles like sodium and chloride cannot cross, cross over the plasma membrane. So this would be like ion channels. Like sodium, chloride, P, um, or K, this is potassium. So that is a positively charged ion. So those charged particles cannot get directly through the plasma membrane, so they have to travel via those channels. Okay. Some of the proteins can be carriers. And so instead of actually forming a hole, they actually bind to the molecule and carry it across. So they change their shape, they change their configuration, they might switch, and they might actually be able to um, move substances through. So a good example of this would be glucose carriers. So um, some larger molecules can be transported via these carriers. And it's really interesting because our blood that goes into our um, kidneys Oftentimes, a lot of the glucose gets filtered out and then has to be reabsorbed. And so these carriers are really important in reabsorbing glucose from our urine so that we don't have excessive glucose loss through urination, that those carriers are important. Okay. They can also bind to the plasma membrane. Oh, excuse me, not to the plasma membrane. Ah, sorry. Bind to the cytoskeleton. Because they are a part of the plasma membrane. So they can bind to the cytoskeleton. And so that's where you see filaments of the cytoskeleton underneath. And you see that some of them might be bound to those, um, those cytoskeletons. And there is a disease that is due to a defective uh, protein that binds the plasma membrane to the cytoskeleton. And this is what is referred to as muscular dystrophy. So this means that a person can be born with this, for example, and then their muscles will start to um, uh, become atrophy and start to kind of break down. And so muscular dystrophy is due to a, a protein called dystrophin that helps to bind the plasma membrane to the cytoskeleton. So defective protein. And that's specifically important in skeletal muscle, where when you think about skeletal muscle, when the cells contract, they have to pull against the plasma membrane, right? And if that doesn't work, then the cells can't contract and they'll start to just um, atrophy. The fourth thing that they can do is, is that they can serve as um, cell receptors. So can serve as receptors, we'll put, on the surface of the cell. So there's lots of things that can't get into the cell. And so what they do, what these substances do, they bind to the outside of the cell and then cause the response on the inside of the cell. So for example, hormones, many hormones that are not steroids, hormones bind to receptors, okay? So there is a hormone called growth hormone that is not a steroid, so it's not a lipid. It's actually a protein, 
And growth hormone, when it binds to these receptors, it would stimulate cell division. So growth hormone is really important, specifically when we are um, developing and our bones are lengthening in size. So the growth hormone can bind to the bones, the plates, the growth plates in the bones, and actually stimulate cell division. And um, so that is another really important um, aspect of those receptors. And then finally, they're used in um, self-recognition. So they're used in cell-cell recognition. So for example, the reason why you cannot be transfused, if you're type A and they get it, you get transfused with type B blood, is because your type, your body does not detect type B blood as being the self, right? It's being foreign. And so your white blood cells will start to break it down and you'll have a transfusion reaction. Same thing goes when you get an uh, organ transplanted into you. The organ is going to contain different receptors on its surface. And that uh, those receptors um, um, are different and your, your body's immune system is going to detect them as foreign. So that idea of cell-cell recognition is important. And interestingly, this is associated with glycoproteins. So what do you think the glyco refers to? What is attached to the protein? What type of molecule is attached to my protein? Where have we seen this word before? Sugar. Sugar. Because you've seen it in the word glycogen, right? And so if we go back up to our diagram, right? This is my glycoprotein right here. So the sugar coating on the outside of the cells allow them to detect cell from cell. Now, interestingly, sometimes when we develop cancer, and we're going to talk a lot more about cancer, but our cancer cells can sometimes have different proteins on their surface and different glycoproteins. And so even though a lot of us get cancer, probably all of us have, have had cancerous cells arise, because the cancer cells have different proteins and glycoproteins on their surface, our immune system, if it is strong enough, can attack it and destroy the cells because before they become um, a, a problem to us. So I'm going to show you just a short little um, lecture video on the importance of that sugar coating on the outside of the cells. I think this is nine minutes. Oops, where did it go? Sorry, it's not the video. Just a second. Oh, and I hope they fixed my speakers. Oh, yeah. talk about sugar and cancer. And I became interested in sugar when I was in college. Not this kind of sugar. It was the sugar that our biology professors taught us about in the context of the coding of your cells. And maybe you didn't know that your cells are coated with sugar. And I didn't know that either until I took these courses in college. But back then, and this was in let's just call it the 1980s, people didn't know much about why our cells are coated with sugar. And when I dug through my notes, what I noticed I had written down is that the sugar coating on our cells is like the sugar coating on a peanut m and 
And people thought the sugar coating on our cells was like a protective coating that somehow made our cells stronger or tougher. But we now know, many decades later, that it's much more complicated than that, and that the sugars on our cells are actually very complex. And if you could shrink yourself down to a little miniature airplane and fly right along the surface of your cells, it might look something like this, with geographical features. And now the complex sugars are these trees and bushes, weeping willows that are swaying in the wind and moving with the waves. And when I started thinking about all these complex sugars that are like this foliage on our cells, it became one of the most interesting problems that I encountered as a biologist and also as a chemist. And so now we tend to think about the sugars that are populating the surface of our cells as a language. They have a lot of information stored in their complex structures. But what are they trying to tell us? I can tell you that we do know some information that comes from these sugars, and it's turned out already to be incredibly important in the world of medicine. For example, one thing your sugars are telling us is your blood type. So your blood cells, your red blood cells, are coated with sugars, and the chemical structures of those sugars determine your blood type. So for example, I know that I am blood type O. And how many people are also blood type O? Get your hands up. It's a pretty common one. And so when so few hands go up, either you're not paying attention or you don't know your blood type. And both of those are bad, okay? But for those of you who share the blood type O with me, what this means is that we have this chemical structure on the surface of our blood cells. Three simple sugars linked together to make a more complex sugar. And that, by definition, is blood type O. Now, how many people are blood type A? Right here. So that means you have an enzyme in your cells that adds one more building block, that red sugar, to build a more complex structure. And how many people are blood type B? Quite a few. You have a slightly different enzyme than the A people, so you build a slightly different structure. And those of you that are AB have the enzyme from your mother, the other enzyme from your father, and now you make both of these structures in roughly equal proportions. And when this was figured out, which is now back in the previous century, this enabled one of the most important medical procedures in the world, which of course is the blood transfusion. And by knowing what your blood type is, we can make sure, if you ever need a transfusion, that your donor has the same blood type so that your body doesn't see foreign sugars, which it wouldn't like and would certainly reject. What else are the sugars on the surface of your cells trying to tell us? Well, those sugars might be telling us that you have cancer. So a few decades ago, correlations began to emerge from the analysis of tumor tissue. And the typical scenario is a patient would have a tumor detected and the tissue would be removed in a biopsy procedure and then sent down to a pathology lab where that tissue would be analyzed to look for chemical changes that might inform the oncologist about the best course of treatment. And what was discovered from studies like that is that the sugars have changed when the cell transforms from being healthy to being sick. And those correlations have come up again and again and again. But a big question in the field has been, why? Why do cancers have different sugars? What's the importance of that? Why does it happen? And what can we do about it if it does turn out to be related to the disease process. So one of the changes that we study is an increase in the density of a particular sugar that's called sialic acid. And I think this is going to be one of the most important sugars of our time. So I would encourage everybody to get familiar with this word. Sialic acid is not the kind of sugar that we eat. Those are different sugars. This is a kind of sugar that is actually found at certain levels on all of the cells in your body. It's actually quite common on your cells. 
But for some reason, cancer cells, at least in a successful progressive disease, they tend to have more sialic acid than a normal healthy cell would have. And why? What does that mean? Well, what we've learned is that it has to do with your immune system. So let me tell you a little bit about the importance of your immune system in cancer. And this is something that's, I think, in the news a lot these days. You know, people are starting to become familiar with the term cancer immune therapy. And some of you might even know people who are benefiting from these very new ways of treating cancer. What we now know is that your immune cells, which are the white blood cells coursing through your bloodstream, they protect you on a daily basis from things gone bad, including cancer. And so in this picture, those little green balls are your immune cells, and that big pink cell is a cancer cell. And these immune cells, they go around and they taste all the cells in your body. That's their job. And most of the time, the cells taste okay. But once in a while, the cell might taste bad. Hopefully that's the cancer cell. And when those immune cells get the bad taste, they launch an all-out strike and they kill those cells. So we know that. We also know that if you can potentiate that tasting, if you can encourage those immune cells to actually take a big old bite out of a cancer cell, you get a better job protecting yourself from cancer every day and maybe even curing a cancer. And there are now a couple of drugs out there in the market that are used to treat cancer patients that act exactly by this process. They activate the immune system so that the immune system can be more vigorous in protecting us from cancer. And in fact, one of those drugs may well have spared President Jimmy Carter's life. Do you remember President Carter had malignant melanoma that had metastasized to his brain? And that diagnosis is one that is usually accompanied by number 